So I want to record the thought before it escapes my mind. And hopefully the recording comes out good enough, especially for the fact that my iPad is uh, up updating its software and I am watching or I just watched the uh, part of the Katie Helper uh, show in regards to the midterms, in regards to her interviewing um, Ola Yemi. And outside of her having a really, really pretty name, I love the way that she contextualizes. She talks about the unhumane part of the prison industrial complex politics and the way that we uh, see those who are criminals or better yet, people who have committed crimes, you know, the otherizing, like we don't call people who are, don't have felony records. We don't call us non-felony record havers, but once you do a crime that is deemed felony wise that follows you to the point that people even call you a felony, not a human being anymore, but a scarlet letter, right? And Olayemi is really good at breaking that down and showing our biases in the way that we treat people. And truth be told, the prison industrial complex, just like the the courthouse, is full of poor people, disabled people, people of color who are pleading their cases. You should, if you ever have the time, if you're ever like, I don't know, coming back from a dentist appointment or a checkup or whatever day that you have available that you usually don't while you're working, pop into like a housing court, pop into like any type of public court. You'll see the majority of the people and it's not who you think it would be. And it's not usually that sensationalized, super predator, uh, bad guy on the run. It's usually literally poor people, disabled people, and uh, women, and uh, people of color. So Olayemi was making the point that a lot of people say that they care about these social justice issues. They care about people being able to um, determine how to resolve these issues of crime, how to determine these issues of housing, the homelessness and everything there is to discuss in communities. Our first guest, I'm so excited. She's making her debut on the Katie Helper Show. Uh, you may have seen her uh, on lots of different programs, including on The Breakfast Club. Very exciting moment. Uh, and I'm speaking of none other than movement lawyer Olayami Olurin. Hey, Olayami. 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 Sorry. Uh, Olayami. I got, you got, you Olayami, got it, right? I got like nervous. Yes. I got uh, performance anxiety. Olayami. Welcome. Hey, how, how are you? Thanks so much for coming. Hey, good. I'm good. So not only are you a, a lawyer, but you are also, I think, a TikTok star. Is that fair to say? TikTok, but my, my face be places videos, certainly yeah. socials. <laughs> but yeah. how do you make those really good videos you make? Are those on TikTok? They're everywhere. I, it, honestly, they just, they're my rants. They're my regular. <laughs> they're, and you do them just, just onto your camera? Like, do you post Yeah, them? like literally standard on my phone. Like, wow. the, the way y'all get them straight from me, like, oh, rant. <laughs> they're <laughs> really good. Them. And then do you do the, the subtitles on uh, any particular program automatically Instagram will like automatic oh, click okay. captions and it automates them. Wow. All right. So it's yes. not, I, I thought it had a snap. I thought it was um, a TikTok look to it, but it could you be, know, you thought it was exceptionally talented, but yeah. No, yeah. But, oh, well no. you are exceptionally talented, but not, but, but I thought you were exceptionally talented on another level in another yes, area. No. <laughs> okay. No. Well, thank you so much for coming. And you're someone who covers a lot of uh, important issues, especially crime copaganda uh and you debunk a lot of myths that are oh, spouted yes. out by not just republicans because that's obvious we know republicans are do a lot of dog whistling or sometimes it's not dog whistling it's just overt but sadly the democrats play at this game too so can you just like explain to people what copaganda is how people can recognize it and what uh realities are being covered up by this copaganda yeah 
Well, propaganda is basically the way that like mass incarceration, policing, the criminal system, this idea that like the police, uh, the system is about justice, the prosecutors are all the good guys and other people that find themselves in the system are bad. Um, and it's not just in that we get we get fed that in media, right? We get in our regular mainstream just journalism coverage, right? They take police narratives as absolute fact, they present that as as absolutes, and they just um they, they, they perpetuate that bias to us as, as fact and objectivity. But beyond that, right, beyond just the fact that we're uh, filled with, like, law and order, snapped, just, I mean, the whole true crime genre, just every cop show, Lucifer, it, it's in everything. But it's also in other things, like little things that people don't even think of. It's in the Powerpuff Girls. It's in Darkwing Duck. It's in all these little, like, and that's the way. To me, those are more concerning than... Like law and order, at least to some degree, you know. Once I've right. told you what propaganda is, you think, okay, law and order, you know those things qualify. But you're not going to think about it like, ooh, Darkwing Duck, why is Bush the villain? You know, certain right. things like that. So it's that way. It's the way that constantly throughout our media and our everyday life, we're constantly being programmed and um, basically uh, indoctrinated into believing uh, that our system our system is the only way, one, that that's the only way justice and the criminal system are synonymous, but two, that the people who find themselves in there are villains. Right. And something that a lot of commentators are saying is that Democrats, if they lose, or one of the reasons they're going to lose is because they are running on defunding the police, which I didn't know they were running on that. So what, how do you respond to that allegation? They're liars. I mean, they're just liars. They're liars. They're shameless liars. They're liars. Where where are they? Can you find me exactly who is running on the defund the police platform? Like this is this is the thing that I find interesting, right? Like I've noticed this, and I'm not gonna call their names, but a lot of these uh, 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 commentators that allege to be on our side that have taken this uh, this flagship of running uh, propaganda and all this like right wing nonsense about crime, they keep being like, oh, the rest of us are gaslighting them, are like liable. Oh, there's a crime wave. Here's my thing. Let's forget forget the fact that there isn't this massive crime wave. Forget that. Let's pretend. Let's pretend that's the case. I'm gonna give you that. Sure. Okay. What we're currently doing is what you, mass incarceration. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing. We're doing mass incarceration. We're doing that. Like we have the police have not been defunded anywhere. All of the places that they're mainly highlighting, um, hold on. they're mainly highlighting. Um, as the so sorry, I was getting a call and it just zoomed me uh, out. Yeah, like I know, yeah. Effect, but I'm fine. It's it. good. It's dramatic. Um, it's, it's showing how important yeah. this is. Yeah. But all the places that they're mainly highlighting, like New York City, Chicago, LA, all these places that they're painting out, like Gotham City, right? All these like areas with all the crime. We give more money to the police than anybody. Like, okay, let's say it's true. Let's say New York City is Gotham City. We have a massive crime with the Democrats are in power and they have given more money to policing, more money to mass incarceration. So what's your problem? How what is the issue here? You you say we're supposed to vote Republican, so Republicans can do what? The same thing that according to you, crime is still increasing. I'm living for this zoom dramatic effect. This is I know it's great. Uh, oh, I love it. I'm I'm here for it. So yeah, that's that's what I would say to them. They're liars. They're yeah. liars and they also don't make no sense because they're basically advocating. That's my thing. The only method we're doing right now, the only thing I have never had my political dreams become law. Not one of my political dreams are law policy. So if things ain't going right, they're not going right under y'all's current status quo. So that is not an argument for us to keep doing more of the same. That is not an argument against Democrats, unfortunately, for them. That's how I feel. Yeah. Do you want to try to show you want to? Uh leave and come back in so you're i mean i like the dramatic effect but we may want for editing purposes the, oh yes yeah um yeah we, we i don't know hold on let me see if it does sure. this hold on oh no that didn't work yeah, i'll even come back all right i'll even come back one right. second sure this is because this is too good a conversation to although i do like the dramatic up personal and by the way everyone please like this stream everyone also become a uh patreon supporter at patreon.com slash the katie helper show or you can come support, become supporters of you, uh, useful idiots at uh, at usefulidiots.substack.com. And again, this is a show where we're having lots of guests. So we're having Olaemi on now. Then we're going to have on uh, Ross Barkin. Then we're going to have on Leslie Lee. Then we're going to have on Marianne Williamson. Then we're going to have on Matt Taibbi and Aaron Mate and maybe someone else. Um, I can't confirm that yet. But right now, I'm very excited because we have this a crime expert. And this is one of the biggest things that keeps getting talked about in these elections. And it kind of drives me crazy because, as Olaymi was just pointing out, mass incarceration is the system. It's what's happening now. The police have not been defunded, and no one's really running on that. So uh, 
Why, why do you think it is, though, that Democrats are not framing their uh, reality on their own? Why are they just reacting to these talking points coming from the right? Um, because that's what they do in general. That's what that's all they do in general. All they ever do is respond. That is the problem with why we constantly lose. Just as a just as a point of strategy, the minute you let the other person frame the entire narrative, you've lost. The minute you let them frame it and you're responding, you've lost. It's just that simple. And Democrats do that with everything. Like I believe Republicans practice and successfully they successfully practice a politics of distraction. They just constantly throw in bones at us, and every time. Dems go running instead of actually doing that. And I also think there's a level of Democrats just always being scared about what is the natural, natural response. Like, you're in an adversarial system. Those are your opponents. They're always going to make a move and you have to make a move back. But instead, what Democrats do is every time Republicans do something or maybe might do something is all this fear and panic. I don't understand why the logical response has not been for like, for example, take New York City. Hochul and Zeldin should not be, they shouldn't be close, let alone as close as they are. But yet, they are, because instead of Hochul and them this entire time, they've let Eric Adams... And this is, is the governor, just for people who know, uh, aren't locals, this is the governor's race that we're talking about in the New York State. The governor's race. Yeah. Let, me, let me give you back. So the governor's race in New York City right now, our, our governor is Hochul, who had come in after, you know, the Cornwall scandal. Right. She's a dumb. Zeldin is a right-wing extremist. Um, and normally, <laughs> our very blue New York City, right. it's not close. Normally, it's supposed to be firmly blue. But unfortunately, we've had, you know, uh, fair mongering cop, Eric Adams, just all year, just every day. Like, that's the thing. And I, and I don't want to say I told them so, but I did tell them so. It might be a problem if every day your mayor is every day suggesting that y'all are failures. He's hype. He is literally fair mongering about crime all day. just creating all this hysteria, 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 hysteria. And then he's essentially telling y'all, that y'all are failing, and Democrats are in every office, so who do you think is going to fall back on? But instead of getting it together and maybe not rallying behind this cop in the first place, they'll be stuck with him. No! Right. They Eric Adams was, was a cop, everyone, in case you didn't know yep. that. Yeah. Yep. And they was just rolling him out, like, oh, this messaging expert, Pelosi them had him at the DNC conventions and stuff, and now look. And now look. And now, now you're shocked. Now you're shocked that a, a candidate can come in and take, like, it's not like, it's important to remember Zeldin is not a genius. He didn't come up with these talking points, all right? These right. talking points were fed, were fed. This is literally the campaign that Eric Adams has been on all year. All he did was he's literally invoked Eric Adams himself. So, of course, the people are going to think, you know what I mean? You're going to see, you're going to see uh, support mobilized around that. But honestly, it's basically just Democrats being uh, afraid and always letting Republicans lead. Hmm. And what about this talking point? You, you hear people talking all the time about, Oh, look at this no cash uh, ending bail. This is uh, this person just came out and killed someone because of the bail reform. Can you cut, shed some uh, clarity uh, yeah. in that area? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Again, more just more propaganda, more baseless cap propaganda. First of all, New York City still has a cash bail system. I, I want to make sure that's known. New York City very much so still has cash bill. What happened with bail reform at the top of 2020, which was a move to decarcerate Rikers and get us um, towards, you know, bail reform and also getting us towards the vision of closing Rikers because that's a human rights crisis. Um, but bail reform made certain misdemeanors, misdemeanors and nonviolent crimes, nonviolent felonies, nonviolent crime, uh, non-bail eligible. However, for everything else, violent crime, assault, murder, all these other things people are talking about, cash bail, not only can and will be set on, but statistics have showed that the introduction of, of bail reform has actually led them to set bail higher on those charges. Second of all, on any case, this has always been the case and will always be the case. If you are out on bail for anything in New York and you're rearrested or you violate the terms of your release, bail will be set on you. You will be remanded. That's just absolutely factual. So that's this whole myth, this whole idea that these people out here just committing crime and they're just getting a free. It literally does not work like that. If you violate the terms of your release, you are going, you're going to jail. More importantly, the whole purpose of bail is to ensure that people return to court. Prior to bail reform, about 15, uh, about 15 percent of people didn't return to court. After bail reform, about 9 percent. So actually, bail reform has been incredibly successful. Then as far as all these people fear-mongering about violence and people recommend violence. So the, uh, the Brennan Center did a study, and they studied over 100,000 uh, cases between 2020 to 2021, and only less than 2% of people were rearrested for felonies or violent crime. So then on top of that, most cases in New York State, let alone New York City, over 80% of cases that are charged as felonies are resolved with a non-criminal conviction altogether. So it's just a myth. It's just a myth. Right. And what about the, the stories about rates of crime? Which, which one? 
uh, crime rate that, going up? Yeah. Uh, first of all, so they actually, studies are actually just dropped on this yesterday, a beautiful chart. Um, actually, I wish I had had to link. But not only is the, the crime rate up marginally, despite the fact, what is up is crime coverage. Crime coverage is up. Crime is not what's drastically up. Crime coverage is up. But more importantly, even if it is, that still is not an argument for, that is not an argument in favor of continuing to do the same things that we've been doing, because that's what we're currently doing. It also uh, requires us to interrogate why crime would be up. If crime is up in New York City in 2022, it might have something to do with the fact that in 20, first of all, New York, New York City is one of the most expensive places to live in the world. Our current rent has gone up to an average of $4,000, yet the minimum wage is, what, $15? You lose 40% of your income in taxes. This is an astronomically expensive place to live in. And so if you see crime, it's because you see poverty. And that is just true. That's not that's not a talking point I would like. Right. The, the vast majority of the people in the criminal system are poor, are literally living underneath the poverty line, but specifically in New York City. Almost everybody is represented by a public defender. And that means you have little to no income. So... It would have something to do with the fact that New York City was locked down in a pandemic. Businesses closed down. We had a, we had an eviction moratorium for months because people could not pay their rent. Now imagine what New York City rent is thousands of dollars uh, uh, racking up after months and months and months and months, and then they just up and lifted the eviction moratoriums. So tons of people end up homeless, end up homeless with nowhere to go. Yeah, that's why. That's why crime would be up because people are poor. And, I, and Olayemi was stating that how for years people have been saying that they don't want to be over police, that they want resources so they can better their communities, that they know what they want, which is true. People in less funded and destitute communities know what the issues are, whereas other people, outsiders are like, oh my God, the blight. These people live in the blight. They know exactly what needs to be repaired. They know exactly what is crumbling. They know exactly what are the needs of the people. Because unlike the people who go for the gawks and the stairs and the photo ops or when something really, really bad happens like Jackson, Mississippi, they actually live in these conditions on the regular basis. So once the sensationalized uh, headlines are, are through and nobody cares anymore, these people don't have the luxury of disinvesting or going along with the next headline because they live in those conditions, right? So Ola Yemi was like, basically, I don't understand how so many people are so and these are the whites, these are those who make the laws, these are those who are philanthropists, those who say that they are humanitarians. Um, why they say that they care so much about resolving crime, resolving these issues to be able to... Oh, I'm out of storage. Okay. <clears throat> Let me get back to the thoughts once I delete some stuff in my storage. Ranting. So, as I was saying, Olayemi was like, for all these people who say that they fake care, these people who virtue signal, these democratic small socialists, these people who say these Bernie Sanders esque things but they don't listen to the community they don't stay with the community after the headlines and the sensationalism is over um they don't actually try to hear and meet the needs of the community they don't set up mutual aid they don't do anything they just sit there and either double down on what is failing so more policing more um funding for let's say department of family services which is a whole racket of legitimately stealing people's kids um and in other predatory systems that benefit off of these people being in this destitute situation and i know some people was like well you know that's a fall of the cookie that's the way the cookie crumbles this is capitalism woop -dee -woop -dee -woop. But the way capitalism needs to function, like I've been telling y'all, when you find capitalism, you find slavery. And there's different forms of slavery. Slavery is not just chattel slavery in the way that history teaches it. And history doesn't even teach you the full grasp of chattel slavery. It just tells you the very sanitized version. And if you're from Florida, they just tell you that, oh, there were just workers who just wasn't paid, but everything was A-OK. -okay. Jesus love us all. Like, right? It's just even worse. Um, with their C R T nonsense. They they're, they're hysteria because you know, God forbid the children know the truth about history. 
bold with your chest, manifest destiny. But when you have to teach your children about manifest destiny, then the snowflake in you shines bright like a diamond. But nonetheless, in capitalism, you need a permanent bottom underclass. And capitalism looks different depending on where you are. Like in the United States, Black people and Indigenous people tend to be the people that are the slave class, the permanent underclass, the, the people that are perpetually used to justify the system as is. Now, fun fact, the majority of people in the United States are white and the majority of poor people in the United States are white. But when you see poverty, you usually see the ghetto. You usually see the projects. You either see the inner city grittiness of it all. You don't see the trailer parks. You don't see the Ozarks. You don't see the rural wilderness of it all. You don't see that people still living in the outback. You don't really see that, right? And that's a way to psychologically continue to perpetuate anti-blackness and to continue to perpetuate the stereotype that black people are inferior because you need that in a capitalist system, a system that is a wink and a nod accepting of the society mistreating these groups of people through propaganda, whether it's the savage native or whether it's the barbaric brute African. Those stereotypes manifest in different ways, in different shapes, whether it's actors playing um, unsavory roles or, or racist roles and stereotypes, whether it's music that perpetuates black on black crime, whatever it is, it, there's a perpetual cycle of that archetype. Whether we are aware of it consciously or unconsciously, it exists, right? This is why every rapper, even if they are from the suburbs, has to talk about how they'll kill a nigga, shoot a a nigga, rob a nigga. Like, that's the archetype, right? Not too many people want to hear that De La Soul in 2022. Correct? Correct. So, there needs to be that depiction, even if it is in the accurate depiction or the overall depiction of the numbers. People need to believe in these stereotypes and these archaic thinkings. And the status quo thinking because it keeps the society functionally functioning on a low vibration and functionally on a divisive, a divided point of view. Whether you're blue team, red team, whether you're for this or you're for that, whether you are DeSantis or, or Bernie, like you have to always be on some bandwagoning and it always has to be an other. There always has to be something that is barbaric, something that you're avenging, something that you are promoting, right? Instead of working in solidarity, which would be the overthrowing of the current system as is and, and honing in on that people power so you can have people power in action and workers could take over the means of production, but also People can start envisioning the communities that they want to live in, exactly what all Iami was talking about. The people in the community know what they want. They're just not getting funded. People who are, are hard on crime or tough on crime or people who want to get rid of crime often don't understand that the things that they're advocating for, which is like mass incarceration or more cops um, or austerity, actually creates a lot more crime. Yeah. That's what, my thing is this, right? And... In life, in life, if we want to stop anything, if we want to, we we want to stop or start any type of behavior, we want to, we we have to examine it. That's always it. Why is this? Why is this happening? Right? Why is this happening? Because that's how we would get something something to stop. And the same thing, obviously, is what we need to do for crime. But people are reluctant to do it, and it's because we have created an entire large profit system. One, we've we created an entire profit system around this criminal system. But two, this criminal system specifically. Uh, police is certain certain populations that the larger powers that be want to see police, and that's just the truth of it. Because the reality is, we know this. If you were the same under the the most the safest communities are not the most police communities; they are the most resource communities. We know this. All of the areas that they call high crime areas are the most under resource communities that have continued to be that way generation after generation after generation. Because of course, if you saddle people, you're taking the poorest populations and you're saddling them with criminal convictions and all of the fines rap sheets, collateral consequences of not being able to get a job, not being able to get housing. All of those things follow them for literally the rest of their lives. And thus also all of the children that they produce, the neighborhoods that they produce, the communities. So you are literally guaranteeing 
that a community exists in poverty. And I mean, as far as why it would lead to crime, because if you don't, and, and it's not just, I want to say this about crimes and poverty. People like to think of crimes and poverty like, oh, they stole something. Um, you know, they, they can understand, oh, they stole food or they stole, you know, a thing, how that's a crime of poverty, but they don't see that for like everything else, assault, mental, anything else that comes out of it. But it's like, if you don't have money, if you don't have the resources to deal with anything in your life, how do you think that impacts how you start to think, how you start to feel, how you start to react and everything else conditionally that you're dealing with? If nobody has, you know how many clients I have, like where a mother has been trying to get mental health resources for a child literally since she was born and can't, you know what I mean? A lifetime, a lifetime of doing that and not being able to, you can't get educated. You, you, you can't get proper education. You can't get proper housing. You can't buy proper things. That affects how you respond to life situations and life's actors. You're, you're essentially, another thing we have to remember too, when we judge, when we don't look at violence and these different types of things, we look at them as divorced from poverty and divorced uh, from crime, but it's not. You were literally, we're, we're, we're putting people in environments where they have nothing and forcing them to fend for themselves and to fight one another and to fight over the scarce amount of resources. That, that breeds violence. And then what do you do? You criminalize them and you incarcerate them where they have to, again, fight for their lives. That, again, breeds and indoctrinates violence. And then when they get out, you send them right back into the same under-resourced communities that are already fighting for their lives with that exact, with everything that they've learned to demonstrate what they learned in prison. It's just a, a vicious cycle. So that's why. And so, and what are some of the ways that uh, these problems can be solved? If it's not through incarceration, obviously, or increased police presence, what are the things that we know from research actually lower crime? The, the, the root cause is giving people, giving people money for education, giving people money for housing, giving people help, money for health care and mental health resources, giving people the money to take care of themselves. And that's something that we know and we understand in ev in every single other context, right? We know that people need the means, need the means to take care of themselves, because and that's and also and I think this would tie us to a larger point is listen to those people. The communities are tell tell people what they need. They tell they are literally asking for asking for resources, asking to be heard, asking to have the police taken out of their communities. It's you know whenever they talk about it, it's so interesting. All these different commentators and, and politicians love to use black people as a prop and use victims of crime as a prop to, to to argue in favor of mass incarceration. And they love to be like, oh, black people, crime is the the top thing. Black people are thinking about thinking about crime. Everyone is thinking about their safety. Everybody. That's not a secret. That's not a myth. Everybody, black people, everyone thinks about crime. That does not mean that we have the same response to how we should deal with it. And black people, statistically, victims, advocates are the people that are in favor of criminal justice reform and are telling you, hey, mass incarceration is not helping my community. Policing is not helping my community. Police brutality is not helping my community. So I also think we have to call out these people that continue to, to they end a conversation short. It's just the, the lack of the incomplete rule. Like in court, you, you wouldn't be able to, I can't just insert like an excerpt of our conversation and leave out the rest. Right. That's what they love to do. They love to use black people. Black people care about crime. Yeah, yeah. We're also, if we're, you know what I think is interesting? If black people are, the way these people present it, like black people are the, um, the sole uh, uh, perpetrators of crime, right? So if we're the sole perpetrators of crime within our own communities, right? That's what they say. Our neighborhoods are the high crime areas, the dangerous areas. So we're also the sole victims. We're the victims, right? We're both the perpetrators and the victims of crime. So then how come if we are telling you, we are the ones telling you we are the most, we have the highest police presence, we are most impacted by this criminal system, and we are telling you it's not helping us. It's not helpful. It's harmful. We do not feel safe. We do, this is not doing anything up us. And you know that because you know that. It's literally generation after generation after generation. That's a problem. But peep game. Who benefits from poor people living in their poor conditions? Is it not the payday loan people? Is it not the, even for those who have Medicaid and Medicare, like Massachusetts, if you are below a certain uh, a low, low annual wage, you can have free state health care or even reduced state health care, depending on your income. But plot twist, you perpetually have to be impoverished. You perpetually have to have no money and you perpetually have to be chronically ill. But they don't tell you that and they're not going to tell you that. But if you make $10, $100, $1,000 more than that annual mark, that is always so low, just like the federal minimum wage, 725, is always so low. Then they say that you're making too much money for the bare minimum services that they're providing. And because you make too much money for the bare services that they're providing, now your lifeline to your literal medication 
is no longer available. So even if you luck up to get a better position in life, even if you luck up and you get a better offer to move up the workplace ladder, whether it's any type of marginal gain for you as the worker, you as the poor class person, you're going to lose those itty bitty gains that you have, whether it's EBT food stamps, whether it's Medicaid, Medicare, whether it's a, a child care voucher, any small means, and I mean $10 more, technically you're out of poverty according to the income guidelines and therefore those itty bitty advantages that you were getting to barely hold on collapse. So what does that tell the poor class? And what does it tell the struggling working class? That the only way you're going to get any small marginal gain, something like mass health here in Massachusetts, you have to be perpetually poor and chronically ill to be able to receive access. Because if not, then your option is no access to said healthcare. That's the evils of this current system of things. But also, peep game, there are people whose whole mortgages and lifestyle is funded and paid because groups of people are poor. Who do you think is running the budget for mass health? Who you think are writing the guidelines and eligibility for mass health? Who do you think is getting the funding for mass health? How do providers join into the system of mass health? There's somebody on the back end making these decisions and getting big pay, big faces off of the perpetual systematic impoverishment of people and generationally because these same people who benefit off of creating these systems are the same people who can tell you what is the life outcome for people who are perpetually poor, for people who have subpar health care or no health care. They know exactly the pipeline of poverty to prison. It's damn near pristine. It's damn near bar for bar. And yet, instead of improving the material conditions of the poor, They'll just add maybe a few more means testing or just a means testing or increase the uh, income eligibility. But overall, they're not going to push for a universal health care. They're not going to push for a nationalization of health care. They're not going to push for a social housing. Because people's whole fucking lives are based off of people's impoverished states perpetually being impoverished. Someone's mortgage is getting paid. There are whole children living the best lives that they can. And that's no shade to them because I believe children should have the best childhood that they can. But it is at the expense of poor children not having the slightest access to that said best childhood experience because their parents are profiting off of being the managers of poor life. These kids get to be ballerinas. These kids get to go to ballet. These kids get to go to space camps. These kids get to get extracurricular activities and help and aids and this, that experiences that black kids don't get. Poor kids don't get is built off of the fact that large majority of people will be forced in invisible caves and invisible cells, jail cells, prison cells, invisible cells of poverty in ways that they will never know until they weather in the experience, whether it's legitimate chronic illness, living in these lead painted apartments, living in constant stress in the impoverished and high crime and violent areas, not all the time, 
Just because you find poverty does not necessarily mean that you find violence. But oftentimes you find them in these communities because it's under-resourced. When you're chronically stressed, when you're chronically impoverished, you're chronically agitated. You're not having good health. You're not getting good food. You're not getting good rest. You're not getting good clean air. You're living in tiny and broken and unrepaired housing. There's literally housing projects where the roof is caved in. The ceiling is caved in. Roaches got free rent. Rats got free rents. Lice got free rents. Bed bugs got free rent. The elevator is pissed alley. And the stairs... It is a whole motherfucking haunted house experience in and of itself. The same horror that you you feel in hearing in the words painting a picture for you is nothing in comparison to those who have to live in that space, raise children in that space, age in that state. And know that the city inspector mums the word. The the governor mums the word. The city councilor mums the word. The mayor mums the word. Everybody mums the word. But not until a fire happens and then half the building loses everything, including their lives. Then it's, oh my God, the conditions, the conditions, the conditions, the conditions. The Bronx, remember those Bronx fires that took people out, 19 people? And there was a record of how horrendous that actual building was. But mum's the word because he was funding the pockets of politicians to say nothing about it. Just like the Grenfell Towers in Britain, in Europe, the same tragedy happened. That was even worse because it was like a 50-foot tower and there was families packed up in there. The elevator wasn't working. There was a whole fire and it engulfed people. So these tall, ghettoized, brick despair buildings are just warehouses for the poor. Once the headlines simmer down, there's something else that catches the news, maybe like the Ukraine war. People go about their business. As if those folks didn't really lose their lives. As if those folks don't really live in impoverished and subpar quality of housing. As if anything has changed just because the media has now lost interest in the story. This is how you find perpetual cycles of crime, of incarceration, of mental illness, of homelessness, of addiction, of prostitution, especially survival sex. This is how you have the perpetual cycles of ill and blight. You cannot wealth hoard and then be upset at the fact that poverty follows you like a dark cloud. You cannot have too much here and then be shocked there is not enough there. The skills have to be balanced. And if it is not balanced, then there's always going to be one that has too much and the other that has not enough. And in a country that is not the only the richest country to ever exist but also the most wealthiest empire to exist. The United States has more than enough for everyone to have their needs met. But peep game, why don't we disperse evenly the gains and the material between the collective? Why don't we do that? Because of power power. Just like the invisible cage of poverty, the invisible sense of grandeur. I am a God amongst mortals because I have this power, this invisible power. And the power only exists if the people give it that power. 
because we the people will always be more in collective, more in mass, more in numbers than the power, whether it is a person like a king or whether it's a collective like Congress. There's always going to be more of the masses. And technically, at least for how this country works, it is the masses who elect, as they say, but we know money makes the politics go round. But on the surface, it is the voters, the masses, who vote these people in, right? And then they create the laws and they make the dealings and they sign off on the bills and so on and so forth, right? But we, the people, decide if we want to act accordingly or not because we have a social contract. There's a reason why we don't go a shit and not like the way that the yellow vests go a shit, not like the rest of Europe go is a shit and they have big old protests all up and down the main streets where there's thousands, 80,000, 100,000 people in the streets. It's because we believe in the social contract. We go to work, we pay our taxes, and we act somewhat decent in public, right? Those are our social contract. You meet our needs, we don't go ape shit. That's the social contract. For example, in Europe, when the gas was going up and the people was feeling in their pocket, they went ape shit. The yellow vest organized and they went ape shit. Why? Because the social contract was like, look, I'm feeling to go to work. I'm feeling to be a decent person. I'm feeling to do, pay my taxes. I'm feeling to just be out here being a productive citizen. But once you make my life harder to be that decent citizen, once you make my life harder by trying to go deeper into my pockets to pay this gas that I ain't got, once you make it harder for me to get to work and from back from work, once you make it harder for me to put money in my account, once you make it harder for me to put food in my belly, once you make it harder for me to pay for my housing, then the social contract has been broken. And the way that the yellow vest and other French people, because not everybody who was a part of the protest was yellow vesters, but those who organized for it was the yellow vest, they retaliated by showing you break the social contract. This is our action to show you collectively how we feel about you breaking such contract some of these parliament members found feces sprayed on their houses others found a big loud boisterous protest and everything else in between because once you make it harder for the masses to live a decent existence then the masses make it harder for you to live your bourgeois existence that's the social contract but here in the United States, we are more invested in culture war. We are more invested in our favorite politician. We are more invested in identity politics. We are more invested in punching down. We are more invested in propaganda. We are more invested in clicks and views. So we can perpetually remain on the hamster wheel of poverty and death of despair, but at least we're being entertained in the process. Aren't you entertained? Like the Coliseum. As we all are being plundered deeper and deeper into despair and poverty, at least we can check our Twitter timeline, right? At, at least for now, because, you know, Elon Musk doing what he doing. Billionaires doing what billionaires do. <laughs> you know. Um... Extract, doing what billionaires do, extract and commodify and exploit, doing what they do. So there are whole people whose whole livelihood is invested in perpetuating the cycles of poverty because there's whole systems built around that. Peep game. If we were able to feed everyone within our community, everyone who has a front yard or a backyard, 
We're planting seeds. We're planting vegetables. We're planting fruits. Depending on where you're at and what zone you're at, right? I'm from Massachusetts, so I'm zone nine. So there's only certain fruits that I can plant and certain species of fruits and vegetables that I can plant in my area. Whereas if I was like, let's say Atlanta, Georgia, there are certain plants that I can only specifically plant and grow or or vegetation in general that I can plant and grow in Atlanta versus Massachusetts. What if we decided to, hey, whatever plot of land we see, we plant in seeds, whether we own said plot of land, whether it's empty, whether it's your own, whatever the case may be, we are using these empty spaces of land to actually do something with it. No more of that low cut, uh, sanitized, dead ass, even suburbia, perfection, stuffy, HOA style lawns. We're not doing that anymore. We're going to actually act like we're human beings and we actually live in nature and we're actually going to grow food that we could actually eat, right? Especially since, you know, things are getting more expensive in the grocery stores, which means that more and more families, more and more working class, more and more poor class people are going to feel it in their pockets. So what if we were able to collect leftover foods from fast food restaurants to boutique restaurants to mid-sized level restaurants or or chain restaurants, whatever the case may be, every community was able to 8 p.m., 10 p.m., whatever closing time is, able to collect the leftovers and feed it to those who don't have the money to buy food. Because in some cases, restaurants and grocery stores Not only do they throw an enormous amount of food they wasted, and it's perfectly fine, but in certain states, they put laws against giving people the food that's left over for the day. They've put laws on the books to make it illegal, or at least some form of accountability if something goes away, which could happen, but most times than not, it doesn't. And that's a way to make us, the citizens, the commoners, our community members, feel as if there is some legal repercussion, some authority repercussions for feeding their community members. They don't want the legal hassle of it all. So some people, some restaurants, some grocery stores, instead of just throwing the leftovers They actually not only throw the trash away, but they lock the trash to make sure that no one can go into the trash because dumpster diving used to be a thing. And and I think it is to a certain degree, but it used to be a thing maybe 10 years ago where people would just dumpster dive, whether it is to get food, but other people would do it at, let's say, a TJ Maxx or any store to get like stuff that the store throws away. Sometimes the items were barely used. Sometimes the items were still good. They were just returned, but still in the box. So just opened and people would get it for a steal. Why not? It's in the trash. Technically it's quote unquote garbage, but capitalism is so greedy. It's so rapacious. Even the trash it, it, it has to be locked up. It has to be commodified. It has to be separated. It has to be controlled. Because God forbid a poor person eats for the free. God forbid we feed people for the free. So if we were able to feed each other, what would EBT do? What would SNAP do? What would these services do if we were able to feed ourselves? And getting deeper than that, what are the people going to do like the operations manager, the supervisor, the claims person, the person who collects your personal information, the person who processes it, your caseworker, whatever, whatever, whatever. What the fuck going to do? Because they're not going to have a job. What them folks going to do? They're not going to have a job. 
if we were able to feed everybody within our community, what them EBT folk gonna do? They out of a job. And if they're out of a job, that means they can't pay their bills, which means that they probably can't pay for their housing. So then they find themselves in the same position as the clients that they're here to supposedly serve. In capitalism, you need a permanent underclass. You need a group of people permanently at the bottom because there's whole institutions built on controlling, manipulating, shaping, creating, discussing, policy-driven in creating the reality for these permanent underclass people. Whole people's lives are built on making sure that these poor people stay poor. Because when you solve the issue, you can't continuously make money and make career and make policy and, and, and influence and this and the third about a problem that's already solved. Just like you got to subscribe to life, this poverty thing, the cycle of poverty thing, you have to make it subscribable for these people in these communities. Because if not, what happens to the policymakers? What happens to the operation managers? What happens to the case managers? What happens to the processing clerk? What happens to the funding? What happens? That's the system that we live in. So the idea of working hard it's not going to outdo these systems that are literally built on consolidating your poverty instead of pathways legitimately out of your poverty or pipelines out of your poverty. No, they don't exist. And as you can see, it's just not profitable for it to exist. And yes, you will have exceptions to the rules that break the mold. But usually they had to be literally an anomaly to do so. Super smart ended up at Harvard. How many people end up being accepted into Harvard? Never mind those who apply and don't get in. Never mind the majority of people are not college graduates. Never mind the majority of people don't even go to Ivy League institutions. Never mind all of that. And a particular class is able to entertain and, and, and be able to penetrate that Harvard elite circle. Like, never mind all of that. But what is the likelihood of those actually being accepted? I say that to say is that These systems are not going to change within legislation, NAN law, NAN representative, NAN narrat. Because who's going to vote themselves out of a fucking job? Who's going to vote themselves out of a fucking career? Definitely not mass health. Definitely not EBT SNAP. Definitely not all of these housing authorities, all these institutions playing ping pong with the lives of impoverished people. Because there's a yearly quarterly bonus and profit margin that is made from that. You should also peep game and do your own research of how many of these uh, providers actually end up scamming the government especially those who provide hospice care, senior care, services to the poor. You should really look into how many of these entities end up <gasps> price gouging the government. Ha! Huh. Capitalism produces greed? <gasps> you don't say. Meanwhile, the poor still ain't getting what they need to be getting, still underfunded, still under-resourced, still no access. But the provider living large, 
off of literally the backs of disabled, poor, black women, people of colors, backs. That is the system that we live in. So y'all let me know what you think. I know this was a spicy, spicy, spicy thing, but it's material dialectics. That's material dialectics. It works both ways. We just can't look at it from like, oh, this is why everything is evil and everything is bad. And socialism works great for the disadvantaged, for the workers, for the proletariat. You also have to see it from the other side, how it benefits those who currently benefit from the system as is. You have to see why they like it and why they double down on it and who is getting what from what and from whom and for why and how. Because it only strengthens your cause and your rhetoric when you can pair like, oh, we should do socialism or we should do social housing or we should do community this and a third. When you can pair it up with, oh, these are the statistics. These are the numbers, but also peep game. This is why they're doubling down on this system that don't work because somebody's whole mortgage is betting on you perpetually being poor. When you slice and dice it like that, you can't see nothing but the injustice and the purposeful exploitation. But that is capitalism. And we are all one paycheck away from finding ourselves being exploited by the same capitalism that we love so much. It's always fun on the way up. Not so much on the way down. Ain't that right, 2008 mortgage crisis. And the greatest wealth transfer ever, COVID-19 pandemic. How is your nest egg feeling right now? What about your retirement? Are you able to buy your first home? Yikes. Leave your comment down below. Like, comment, share, subscribe, all of that jazz. Um, and I shall see you on the next video. Peace. Listen, I don't normally say it, but the titties are titties.